Welcome, everybody. Again, welcome those of you who are in the United States, those of you who are in Central America. Uh, welcome back to our webinar, Extreme Events in Central America, Reducing Risk, Enhancing Resilience. Uh, our event continues this afternoon with two more panels. Uh, the third panel is titled The Social and Political Sequels of Environmental Vulnerabilities. It will run from from now, from 2 p.m. Uh, Miami time to 3.30 p.m. And then we'll continue with our uh, conclusions panel uh, and the role of extra regional partners. Uh, so before and before we get into our third panel, I want to take this opportunity to thank all the people who have made this, this possible. I'm doing now so, you know, so, uh, most people can hear uh, how grateful we are for all the support we have received in putting this, this together. Our colleagues at SIPA and the Graham Center, and particularly to Lindsay Dudley, who has been working behind the scenes hard to make this all possible. So thank you. Thank you all for, for your dedication to this. As I said, uh, we have another wonderful panel, uh, and this is not because I'm, I'm in it, uh, but because of my colleague, my friends, uh, Eric Olson and Randy Pestana. The panel is titled The Social and Political Sequels of Environmental Vulnerabilities. I'll, I'll moderate the panel and also I'll participate. And the order we will follow will be, I'll start uh, with some remarks and then uh, we'll be followed by Eric Olson and Randy Pestana. And before, before we start, let me introduce myself again. My name is uh, Jose Miguel Cruz. I'm the Director of Research at the Kimberly Green Latin American Caribbean Center at Florida International University in, in Miami. I've been, I'm a Central American, I'm originally from El Salvador and I've been working on issues on democracy, uh, security, governance, uh, violence for, for, for many years. What am, I, what am I going to do this afternoon to uh, start this panel and to, and to frame the discussion of, of, of this panel is basically I will uh, present some data uh, related to our topic today. This is data on uh, base, that I'm extracting from the uh, public, uh, from LAPOP, uh, the Latin American Public Opinion Project. Let me just fix my, my, my screen that is not working very well and I cannot see what you guys are, are seeing. Um, I'm sorry about this. Um, this is just a technical thing. Um, so as I said, uh, this is my presentation basically will try to offer um, a framework for the discussion on the social and political sequels of environmental uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, if we can see the next slide, please. So the, 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 what I'm going to do basically is to present public opinion data on disasters and, uh, and climate change. Uh, then I'm going to show how uh, this, uh, how these uh, events, uh, disasters, crises uh, generated by, by natural disaster basically have an impact, have a political impact on whether people support or not uh, democracy, whether people support or not the political system. And then I will finish with some, some, some implications for our region and for the responses, especially for the responses, the political responses to the vulnerabilities in, in Central America. Next, please. So the, uh, in, in terms of public opinion on climate change and disaster in Central America, uh, LAPOP has been doing recently in the last two or three um, rounds, LAPOP, the Latin American Public Opinion Project housed at Vanderbilt University, has been, they have been doing, uh, collecting this information about uh, basic questions about climate change and, and disasters. We can, can we see the next one, please? Uh, and one of the one of the 
key question is this one. How serious is climate change? Now, remember, these are, the, these are people, you know, uh, regular uh, Central Americans, uh, of all Central America responding to this basic question. How serious is climate change? And what I'm showing you right now, what I'm showing is the averages of people saying that climate change is a serious problem. It's a very serious problem. And this average runs from zero all the way to 100, being 100 being, you know, the highest level of seriousness as climate change. So the the, the more people approach as 100, you know, they consider climate change as a as a serious problem. And in general, what the results are telling us, and you you can see them in in the screen, the results are telling us that most Central Americans, almost all Central Americans, rather basically see climate change as a serious problem, right? Uh, and this is basically very a, a, a view that is shared by almost all Central Americans in a point that even is above sort of the average for the whole Latin American region. So Central Americans are more concerned about climate change than even the regular Latin Americans and even much more than Americans. Uh, the average in, in the US is only 65, right? It's Americans don't see climate, oh, many Americans don't see climate change as, a, as an issue. Well, Central Americans do, and that can, that can be an advantage in terms of awareness, right? They know that climate change is, is real, it's happening, and it has an impact on their the daily lives. Can we watch the next one? So the other question is, uh, uh, is a more personal one, and is this, the likelihood of being harmed or killed by natural disaster, right? How likely is, how likely do you think it is that you can be harmed or killed by natural disaster? And again, what we see is, again, uh, some awareness among Central Americans that they can be affected by natural disasters. You can see that very high in the case of Costa Rica, El Salvador, and Guatemala, uh, and, and also Honduras and Panama. Uh, unfortunately, this question uh, wasn't asked in, in Nicaragua. Uh, and again, the average in this case is above the regional average, meaning the average of Latin America, right? In the Southern Cone, where we find the lowest average is only 55. So Central Americans, again, are more are concerned, are more worried than the rest of the region in terms of being affected by natural disaster. And this, again, this uh, reinforces this idea that Central Americans are very much uh, 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 conscious of you know, the implications of things like climate change and natural disasters on, on their daily lives. Can, can we see the next one, please? Now, this is, uh, these are not precisely opinions, but these are actually the percentages of people who said that they had been affected, severely affected by droughts and floods in the, in the last three years in Central America. And these are percentages, right? You have percentages for each country people being or percentage or share of the people being affected by droughts and, and floods, right? And you can see how in the case of, of droughts, but you see in Nicaragua, almost a third of the population said that they have been affected, are severely affected by droughts in the last three years, right? The lowest percentage is, 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 is we find it in, in, in Costa Rica, I'm sorry, in Panama, and then in Costa Rica. In terms of floods, in terms of floods, uh, the percentage is a bit lower in, in comparison with um, with droughts. But still, you see that in countries like Costa Rica and Panama, in this case, they have been more affected by by floods uh, uh, than in El Salvador or in Guatemala and and and, and Honduras. Now, these are the data. These are the general data that we have in LAPO on a natural disaster. There are, in other years, uh, LAPO has been able to collect information about, um, about earthquakes. 
In this case, these are data from uh, 2019, the, the, the year before the, the pandemic hit. Uh, so these are the data most recent that are available to us. Can we move to the next one, please? So, so now, the other part that I want to connect this with is the public opinion on support for democracy in Central America. Uh, and, and I think this is very important because this allows us to show the relationship between these events, these experiences with how people, uh, whether people support or not democracy. Let me show you just uh, to start uh, the, the opinions on democracy in Central America. Can we see the next one, please? And, and, and the, the, the opinions, what they show, uh, the next, please, um, what they show in, in, in Central America, can we see the next one? So maybe there is a, okay, here we go. Um, so in terms of support for democracy in, in, in Latin America, what we see is that, you know, uh, uh, we find Central America in different places when we compare with other countries, right? Naturally, support for democracy is higher in, in Costa Rica. Uh, given its tradition, right, as a democratic uh, country. But then other countries such as Guatemala and Honduras, the support for democracy among the population is quite low. It's the lowest in, in, in the region. Can we see the next one, please? Instead of uh, satisfaction how democracy works, we have a more mixed picture, right? We have Nicaragua that for some reason People seem to be uh, uh, satisfied with the with how democracy works in Nicaragua, although Nicaragua hardly qualifies as a democracy nowadays. But still, people think that you know it's is in somehow delivering. Uh, and then Costa Rica, and then we have the the rest of the countries. Can we see the next one, please? Now, when we compare in general as a region, as a Central America, the Central American region the support for the political system, the support of how the, the, the system works beyond whether this is democracy or not, uh, uh, what we find is that there is you know, ups and downs, but really no significant change in the last two decades, right? In terms of the political system in general. But when it comes to support for democracy, what we see is a clear, a clear decline in terms of support for democracy, right? It goes, it went from being very high at the beginning of the 2000s to going very, to going low, even uh, uh, under, if I can see this well, well, under 50 uh, as, a, as an average in the last, in the last year in which, in which LAPO measured this. So there is a decline in the support uh, for, for democracy uh, from the population. Can we see the next one? So what I have done here in this part of a longer project that I, I expect to, 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 to publish soon is to measure the impact of certain disasters like floods and droughts on the support in the political system. So I run a series of uh, quantitative analysis. Can we see the next one? Please, uh, those are there. I'm not going to get into all these numbers. It's just to show you that I, I run the numbers. I consider many variables. Can we see the next one? And, and to put it clear, basically the message is that people who have been affected by droughts, mm, people who have been affected by droughts have uh, or, shows, or show less support for the system that people who haven't been affected by droughts. In other words, being a victim, and I'm saying this very carefully, being a victim of a natural disaster basically depletes your trust in the political system. In the case of droughts, can we see the next one, please? And, and also in the case of floods, right? People who have been victims or have faced floods in their neighborhood, right? In the last three years, uh, obviously less trust in the political system, right? Than those who haven't, deal, haven't dealt with this, right? Can we see the next one? Um, and it seems that droughts tend to have even a longer impact, right? Even than floods, because floods uh, are 
perceived by many as a sort of sudden event, right? Whereas droughts with its, you know, length, its, its long protracted events affect very much the way people, uh, the people go uh, with their lives, right? And affect them very, and sometimes very, in a very severe way. Can we see the next one, please? So my point is, uh, uh, my point is that all beyond what we as political scientists, I'm a political scientist, we usually, when we, when we consider the, 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 the factors that are behind this decline in uh, support for democracy, uh, the decline in the trust and institution, we usually look at, you know, the typical variables, the typical factors, right? Uh, security, corruption, um, the economy, right? But what these data are showing in a, in a very preliminary way, I have to say, in a very preliminary way, is that also natural disasters have an impact, a political impact. They also basically erode uh, political support in Central America, particularly when it comes to long-term events like droughts, right? Uh, that are sustained, that are affected, that are impacting the, the daily lives of, of the people. They add uh, instability and the perception that the, that, the, that the system is unable to deliver. So we need to take into consideration in the case of Central America, uh, based on this data, we need to take in, in, into, into account that similar events and disasters contributed to issues of insecurity in governance as well. And, and this is something based on what we heard this morning, right? Based on the, discu the discussion this morning that many of these, uh, the risk, the vulnerabilities are there and are going to remain there we need to take them into account when we think um, governance in Central America. And in, in, when I say governance, I'm referring to the traditional classical way of, of, of referring to governance, right? The possibility to rule, to rule over the population. And if it is a democracy, to rule in a democratic way. So if these kind of events affect that, 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 that capacity, that possibility. Can we see the next one? Uh, so natural disasters and emergencies increase the pressure for delivery to governments. And the government, what we need to also consider is that the governments, that governments in the region are already stretched thin with daily challenges. So even as they are, as we are before COVID, before hurricanes, before earthquakes, poverty, insecurity, uh, inequality, weak in infrastructural power that Jorge Vargas uh, Culel, uh, uh, Culel talked this morning, all these things already are basically putting a lot of pressure on institutions in, in, in Central America, right? So what, what should we do? Well, one of the things that we should start with is that to, 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 to realize that these demands for delivery are information and transparency. Right? We need to know what is ha what's happening, and we need to know the resources that these countries are putting into, into these events and this, 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 this situation, right? To be able to respond, not only institutions, but also civil society. So the first step should be increase of information and accountability. And this is something that we need to, to, to stress, to stress, I'm sorry. Uh, to reinforce a lot in the next in the next months. Can we see the next one? And to conclude, then uh, can we see the next uh, slide, please? So to conclude, um, the next, yeah, thank you. Uh, so I just wanted to bring back one something that my mentor used to say, Ignacio Martin Baró. He used to say, you know, this is 40 years ago. He used to say that Central Americans live in a permanent state of vital emergency, right? They already live in emergency, right? So the question is, in these circumstances, how do we change that? And this is the question I want to leave uh, you guys with uh, in, this, in this panel. Thank you, thank you for your attention. So, um, okay. So now we're going to hear 
uh, Eric Olson. And let me introduce appropriately Eric. Uh, Eric is the Eric Olson is the director of policy and strategic initiatives at the Seattle International Foundation. Uh, his primary responsibility is to oversee the foundation's engagement with the based policy community. He also provides a strategic policy advice to the foundation Central American partners on priority issues, such as promoting rule of law and good governance, uh, and enforced migration and displacement, ensuring equity and strengthening civil society. He oversees uh, Seattle International Foundation's anti-impunity project and independent journalist fund. In addition of his work at Seattle International Foundation, Olson is a Wilson Center Global Fellow. He served as the Mexico Institute and Latin American Programs Deputy Director for 11 years. He has published numerous articles and books, including Crime and Violence in the Northern Triangle, How U.S. Policy is Helping or Hurting, and What Can Be Improved. And prior to his arrival at the Wilson Center, he worked with the Secretariat of Political Affairs at the Organization of American States as the senior specialist on good governance at Amnesty International USA as advocacy director for the Americas and at the Washington Office of Latin America, WOLA as senior associate for Mexico. So I leave you with Eric, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Jose Miguel. Uh, it's always a pleasure to uh, share the, the, the uh, scene with you. Um, and I, I've, I've learned a great deal from your work in the past. In fact, you'll, you'll see evidence of that right now as we go through this presentation. Um, I, want, I also want to give a shout out to a, a friend of many years ago, David Bray. Uh, I think he's on the line. I see his name there. So uh, nice to, to at least see you with us, David, and I uh, hope you're well. Um, this is a paper that uh, I'm going to present the summary of a paper that I wrote recently with Joy Olson, who happens to be my wife, uh, and I wrote commissioned by Randy Castana and the Gordon and Green Centers, and uh, we were looking at, the, the commission was to look at the uh, drivers of migration. Uh, from Central America. And, and I, I think what we said from the beginning is, you know, we are happy to do this, uh, but most of the traditional drivers of migration have been looked at before. Um, and, uh, and we weren't particularly interested in spending a lot, a lot of time reviewing and looking at all that data and information before. Uh, we do touch on them in our paper, uh, including natural disasters, obviously, uh, as Jose Miguel just mentioned, violence, poverty, and all the pull factors, economic opportunity, the need for protection and security, uh, the failing U.S. immigration system, family reunification, all those things that are widely known and been discussed elsewhere, we touch on briefly. But our, I think what we were most interested in is exploring the broader framework uh, with, from which people uh, are choosing to leave, choosing to migrate, uh, and taking this enormous risk of migrating through Central America and Mexico and trying to make it to the United States. And we kind of hit on, on a series of uh, complex relationships uh, that, that from personal experience, the notion or concept of happiness, subjective well-being, and its connections to migration. And so let me just uh, focus on some of the specifics given the limited time we have uh, of, around the things that we came up with. Uh, and certainly, like in so many uh, academic pursuits, uh, one of our conclusion is we need to do more study. Uh, I guess that's unsurprising, but, but so this is kind of scratching the surface, looking at some of these broader contextual issues uh, that uh, propel people to come to the United States. And I'll start here with a quote from our good friend, Jose Miguel, uh, that he wrote back in 2016. And that uh, is, you know, very related to what he was just, you were just talking about Jose Miguel, but um, and you know what jumps out at me uh, is this notion that one's experience, uh, personal experience, is profoundly 
profoundly affects your understanding of the broader context in which you you live. An example uh, given was uh, when police officers abuse their power by accepting bribes, mistreating citizens, participating in criminal activities, people are not only not only lose confidence in that police or the police, but also in the general regime. We see a, an erosion in the legitimacy of the regime to use the political science terms. And uh, that's really important that the personal experience affects uh, how you view the context in which you live. Um, but in addition to that, and maybe kind of broadening that understanding, is all the literature around what's been defined as subjective well-being, SWB. And uh, you know, this is a concept that's been around for a little while, but I think is only now beginning to be applied to the issue of uh, of migration in Central America in particular. Just, just to, for a starting point, subjective well-being is defined as a person's cognitive and effective evaluations of his or her life. How do you feel about the context uh, in which you li live? Uh, and in addition to that, low feelings of subjective uh, well-being may not reflect specific experiences, which is a little different than what Jose Miguel was talking about, but a general outlook and feelings of hopelessness about the future. Uh, and there are some studies that have, uh, well, before I go on to that, we kind of uh, delved into three broad areas that we're calling contextual factors that contribute to this feeling of low self uh, subjective well being and of hopelessness uh, in Central America. First, and you know, is the general situation of human rights. I think the State Department's country reports on human rights practices in Central America make that very clear. The significant human rights issues in all three countries in the Northern Triangle related to abuse, torture, forced disappearance, and extrajudicial killings. As well, as well as problems of impunity in the justice system. Um, this is a composite of each one of those three countries. I don't, you know, it's not a specific quote for, for any one in particular, but there's clearly a broad uh, panorama of serious human rights abuses that contribute to people's general feelings of well being and hopefulness uh, in, in the region. The second one, of course, is the governance issue. Uh, weak and ineffective governance suggests that democratic institutions are not functioning as they sh should, and basic public needs are not being met. And I think, you know, we looked at the example of hurricane response in Honduras, and in particular, the problems in Honduras uh, that was, on the one hand, the, you know, hardest hit by the two hurricanes, Eta and Iota back in November, but also least prepared. They had set up uh, this, this uh, ministry, COPECO, to do emergency preparedness, uh, to prepare for exactly this kind of thing. And yet when the time came, uh, they were completely unready, un unprepared to act. Part of it is that COPECO had suffered a series of uh, corruption scandals uh, in their response to COVID-19. The, the director had stepped down because of corruption related to COVID-19. The government had appointed a rapper, uh, a, a, a musician by the nickname of Killa, to be in charge of Copeco uh, prior to the hurricanes. He himself admitted he had no experience in emergency response or preparedness, but he was going to give it his best. Well, not surprising, two monster hurricanes hit within a, a week's period and Copeco is completely unprepared, no shelters, uh, very limited ability to get food to those in dire need. So governance is weak uh, throughout the region. Uh, we focused more on Honduras, but I think you know, there are examples from all those others. And you know, it, it caught our attention as we were looking at the U.S. Southern Command strategy for uh, that's currently in 
in force called Enduring Promise for the Americas, that they too highlighted this problem of weak governments. People, this is a direct quote, people who lack confidence in their governments are more likely to leave their countries in hope of finding better opportunities elsewhere. Uh, you know, it's logical, but we don't always make those connections. And I think both uh, Jose Miguel's research and what we're writing about dealt with that. Um, and then the third one, uh, in addition to governments, maybe a subset of governments, is the incredible problems of corruption in Central America. And here we just compile a series of indices from Transparency International, from the World Justice Project, uh, uh, the World Justice Project Rule of Law Index, Absence of Corruption, Worldwide Governance in Indicators from the World Bank. All these indicators are at the bottom uh, third or below uh, of, of, of rating and have been on a downward trend. Honduras uh, lost 11 points between uh, 2019, which is what this is, 146. By the time the 2020 report that came out last month, they were 157 out of 198 countries in the world for corruption perception uh, in their countries. That's just one indicator. It's not the be all end all, but it gives you a sense of the downward trend. And I think that's consistent with uh, some of the data that Jose Miguel just um, uh, presented about uh, declining support, uh, belief in democracy and the political systems in their country. It's not really surprising. So. What are the links between corruption and decisions to migrate? You know, we're hinting at this. It's, it's the general concept, the feelings of social uh, subjective well-being. Uh, there's not a lot of research on this, to be honest. And I, I, I you know, it screams out for more uh, dissertations and research. But some of the things we were able to identify, a 2013 study by the Center for International Economics entitled The Effect of Corruption on Migration, 1985 to 2000 uh, was data compiled from 111 countries, uh, not just Latin America, certainly not just Central America, but around the world. And it found, quote, a robust, uh, found robust evidence indicating that corruption is among the push factors of migration, especially fueling skilled migration. Um, uh, you know, I'll just, I don't need to read all these for you, but I will also point to the 2017 uh, study published by GIZ, the German think tank that tries to establish a theoretical framework for, to explain the link between corruption and migration. Um, they found that the, they found that the indirect influence of corruption on migration was much stronger than the direct links. In other words, as I understand it, it's not just your direct experience with corruption, the police guy, officer in a corner demanding a bribe, somebody in the office demanding a, a bribe, excuse me, but the general sense that the system itself is corrupt and hopeless. Um, we ran into, in some of the field research we were doing, not for this study per se, but uh, for other work, uh, Joy and I were along the uh, Guatemala-Mexican border in one of the shelters in Tenosique, Tabasco, Mexico. 80% of the people there were Hondurans, and we were interviewing a number of them, including a woman from Honduras, had a 13-year-old child with her, girl with her, who had really, who was very sick, actually, uh, and they were there for a couple of weeks trying to recover and before they moved on. And, you know, I asked, I mean, we asked many ways, why did you take this risk with a young girl like this? What, what, is, what is driving this so much? And she gave the usual responses, but at the end, in the end, she said, look at, I know that our president is corrupt. This is her words, not mine. I know that our president is corrupt, that our government is corrupt, and I have no reason or expectation that they will respond to my needs and the needs of my daughter. So, you know, kind of symbolized, captured this notion that it was more than just her personal experience, but the general experience of corruption, lack of accountability, impunity that she viewed, she saw in Honduras, that was part of the driver. 
just a quick quote from the Center for American Progress in 2019, the pervasive impunity and indifference, uh, uh, I'm sorry, this pervasive impunity and indifference in Central America has shown so on hopelessness in societies already struggling with staggering violence and high unemployment. The resulting desperation and pessimism have contributed to high migration levels, even in countries where levels of violence have improved in recent years. And I think Honduras is a great example because in 2012, you know, it was the world's, it had the world's highest homicide rate. San Pedro Sula had a homicide rate of something like 300 and some per 100,000, way higher than, uh, you know, places in Afghanistan or Iraq or anything like that. Um, and yet when that, even though that rate of homicides dropped by 50% a few years later, uh, uh, migration has continued to flow. Uh, it's, my, Honduras has become the principal center of migrants from the Northern Triangle. Uh, and uh, so it's not just this particular experience with violence, but the general sense that things are not getting better. Um, so this gets us to the issue of hopelessness and subjective well-being. A lot of this research has really been pioneered by Carol Graham and her colleague, Julie Markowitz at, at Brookings Institution. I refer to this particular study that they did, the aspirations and happiness of potential Latin American migrants. Um, those that intend to migrate demonstrate the qualities of frustrated achievers responses with high objective success in terms of income, but who report low satisfaction with their economic gains and are less happy than average. So your personal situation may be good, or maybe it's not good, but you haven't, you know, you're employed and you haven't experienced direct uh, of violence, homicide in your families, and yet you're, you're what they call the frustrated achiever, uh, uh, have low subjective uh, well being feelings of subjective well being because your overall perception of the situation is poor you're you're not hopeful about the future and that is a serious driver of migration uh, we also refer to a 2014 study that said that individuals with higher subjective well being feelings of subjective well being have lower in international migration desires at the individual level, the subjective well-being migration re relationship appears to be more robust than in the income migration relationship. So even poverty indicators, while are, while are strong indicators, uh, the general feeling of subjective well-being may be a more robust indicator of desire to migrate. And so what does this mean for us? I mean, I think it means we have to understand uh, more thoroughly the complexity of this notion of drivers of migration, uh, you know, homicides, uh, 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 you know, lack of jobs are all issues, but it's also the general context, the general belief of what the human rights situation and what the governance situation, what the corruption situation may be. Personal as well as societal experience informs those decisions and endemic corruption and the destruction of mechanisms of to control corruption, contribute to a lack of hope that life will improve. And that hopelessness is in many cases a powerful uh, incentive to migrate. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Ryan, Ryan, Ryan on, on time. Uh, just uh, announcement, uh, please post your, your questions and the using the, the, um, the Q&A button. I uh, will be um, responding to those questions at, uh, at the end of the presentations. So next one, uh, I have the, the pleasure to introduce you, Randy Pestana, who was my, my student some years ago, I have to say, my good student here at the program of Latin American Studies at FIU. Now he serves as uh, Assistant Director of Research and Strategic Initiatives at, at the FIU's Gordon Institute for Public Policy, where he manages the Institute partnership with the US Department of Commerce, Defense, and State. Mr. Pestana also serves as Director of Education and Training and Cybersecurity at FIU, 
a designated emerging preeminent program. Additionally, uh, Randy serves as an adjunct professor for the Stephen J. Green School of International and Public Affairs and Honors College. His technical specialization is in international relations with focuses on US foreign policy, security studies, and cybersecurity. The majority of his work have been linked to governance and security in Latin America and in Central America, I have to say, uh, and the Caribbean and cybersecurity workforce development issues broadly stated. Mr. Pestana, Randy, has published and assisted on various publications of both academic and defense audience related to US foreign policy in national security. Randy, take it away. Thank you, Miguel. And I appreciate uh, the invitation from you and President Solis and uh, Eric, always a great uh, to be with you uh, on anything related to Central America. I know I've looked up to a lot of your work uh, in the, my development here. Uh, so I, I wanna take a little bit of a different approach uh, to examining Central America, especially in light of, of both COVID, but also uh, Hurricane Eta and Iota uh, that struck uh, just last year. Uh, and really to provide a, an analysis of where I believe Central American security and defense is uh, today and going forward. So the way I felt it's best to do this is to do really a SWOT analysis. So understanding the strengths, the weaknesses, the opportunities and threats associated uh, with the post-COVID, uh, post-hurricane uh, Iota at a uh, engagement, right? So looking first at strengths, and I must caveat this by saying it's relative strengths, uh, and it, it's very, you know, you know, flexible in terms of understanding this as a strength, but how it can eventually uh, evolve into a weakness. Uh, as Eric mentioned in his presentation, right, homicide rates, uh, which you can debate whether it's a great indicator of violence and security uh, in Central America, they have gone down exponentially, right? You saw a few years ago in, in El Salvador, uh, during super monoduda policies by the Salvador Sanchez Seren administration, how bad the security situation came, right? With over 100 per 100,000 uh, leading the world in homicide rates. But other indicators such as insecurity, right? Uh, how, you know, being a victim of corruption or being a victim of crime, uh, whether it's a traditional robbery assault uh, or a homicide, femicide, as we've seen in recent years, the security situation in general in Central America has improved, right? Right, um, And COVID, if you want to give it a silver lining, uh, has prevented a lot of traditional activities on the outside and the movements around that you would normally see in the day-to-day -day Central America. So this is both impacted illicit and illicit actors, right? So even in some cases, you've seen illicit actors uh, actually postponing um, uh, payments, right? Uh, of local communities, right? Because you don't see the income that is coming in the traditional illicit and or illicit means. So you've seen it where security is actually impacted in a positive sense, right? Where the crime and violence has gone down because there's less movement uh, going around. Regardless, even before that, you did see some efforts uh, through the plan of the Alliance for Prosperity. This was the 750 million that was appropriated from the US where you police reforms were actually being successful, right? You saw uh, in the case of Honduras, right? Where a lot of police officers uh, were let go and removed for corruption uh, and other efforts. Um, and you saw implementation of frequent um, lie detector tests and, and, and training and retraining to ensure that, you know, civil uh, police relations were actually positive and favorable uh, and that corruption was not at that levels that it were, right? Um, and then finally, I think a big strength for Central America, and this goes back decades, is that they still maintain strong US support, right? Now this is certainly changing, right? So Juan Orlando Hernandez, president of Honduras, uh, his brother was indicted in New York on drug uh, trafficking charges. And there's links that the president himself uh, was linked to drug trafficking and the laundering of dollars towards the National Party's campaign uh, in 2013, right? Um, so you've seen particularly the Biden administration, although in, in its short time, really focus on democracy and human rights uh, and anti-corruption efforts. So this can easily change the direction, the relationship between Honduras and the United States. You saw this also in, in Guatemala. Guatemala has maintained very strong relations with the United States, but just uh, last year, 
President Alejandro Giametti said, well, Guatemala is still a key ally to the United States, but we question whether uh, the U.S. is a key ally to Guatemala, right? Which creates the perception that the U.S. was only utilizing Guatemala because of the migration crisis. Again, this was during the Trump administration. We anticipate this will go back to uh, traditional good relations uh, under President Biden. And then finally, uh, with El Salvador, President Bukele, who was just in Washington, D.C. a few weeks back and was denied a visit uh, to uh, the White House and met to meet with uh, Latin American advisors, right? So that tells you that this hard line uh, on pro-democracy, anti-authoritarianism could be changing the, the strength of this relationship. But in lieu of that, I think there still maintains strong U.S. support. In weaknesses, I think the biggest one uh, to me is, is, is a combination of corruption, uh, which I won't dig too deep into. Eric talked a, a lot about this, the impact that corruption has on hopelessness uh, that thus spurs migration. But I think really jo low infrastructures and, and poor infrastructure across the state is a major, major weakness that will not be solved overnight or even over the next decade, in my opinion, right? So you saw $5.5 billion worth of damages just from Hurricane Eta alone, uh, according to the Inter-American Development Bank. And infrastructure across the region has not allowed them to effectively respond to natural disasters, right? So Eric talked about the Copeco uh, corruption scandal, right? And the impacts that uh, they had. One, they weren't prepared, even though that body was entered to be able to prepare for this natural disaster, but also the response was not adequate to be able to, to provide the resources and support uh, to the local populations from flooding and droughts. And of course, the corruption mechanisms that previously were there under CSIG and MASI uh, are no longer there, right? So the, the few checks that you actually had on anti-corruption were no longer in place because of a number of different reasons, which we can get into. But thinking ahead, this idea of opportunities, and I think this is where I'm more of an optimist uh, compared to what we've heard so far today. And part of it is, one, $4 billion over four years, right, which the Biden administration has, has put in there. And you have some really intelligent uh, and experienced people in Central America, like Juan Gonzalez and Dan Erickson, uh, who know and understand Central America, and not just at a surface level, right, which uh, I would argue in some cases under the Trump administration, you didn't really have that true understanding. And it was more centrally focused on migration, as opposed to the underlying conditions that led to migration in the first place, right? So I think having a sustained engagement and the possibility of real reforms, right? $4 billion is a lot, but I think the four years is really important because that shows a dedication by the United States government to grow at a gradual pace with these Central American governments in order to build off of the successes that you saw of the plan of the Alliance for Prosperity, but also recognize the weaknesses of the plan of the Alliance for Prosperity and how you can maneuver that and amend that in a way that better works, right? So I think that's a strong opportunity. I think oftentimes because of infrastructure, right, that's so porous, you actually have an opportunity to rebuild from scratch. It's very difficult to reform. It's a lot easier to build an institution that you can build in the institutions from the onset that will allow it to grow successfully. Right? And then finally, you have elections, right? Uh, and, and this is really, for me, the big elephant in the room, right? Because elections always serve as, a, as an optimistic point to say, okay, change can be made if civil society gets together and, and determines the direction they want for their country, right? In Honduras, you have an election uh, in November, uh, but I'm less optimistic because you have candidates that all have been linked to corruption or drug trafficking uh, in some degrees, right? The three major candidates uh, Tito Asfura, Mauricio Oliva, and Yanni Rosenthal, all linked to potential corruption uh, and, and drug trafficking. Uh, and, and if you have a Libre candidate, right, for, so you will have a de facto Manuel Zelaya puppet, uh, in many's opinion, right? So you don't see real progress here. But the population does have an opportunity to select their next leader and hold them accountable, right? In Nicaragua, uh, certainly less optimistic, but still an opportunity. Uh, depending on a number of circumstances that can change conditions, particularly within the opposition. Uh, but in lieu of opposition alliance, 
you're likely to have a uh, Daniel Ortega remain in power. And the role of the military uh, will play a big role because they're the true drivers of change in Nicaragua. I recall a few years ago, uh, Dr. Brian Littell and I wrote a piece on Nicaraguan military culture uh, and, and talked about how they really are the key uh, uh, institution within the state and their ability to shift uh, the direction of the state one way or the other. They're unlikely to move away from Ortega unless conditions are improved uh, in the opposition. And then finally, uh, and this is on Sunday, right? You have legislative elections in El Salvador where the expectation is at minimum, uh, Bukele is going to be able to get a majority uh, in Congress, uh, and in the worst case scenario, and in many's eyes, uh, gain a supermajority, which will allow him to really double down on his authoritarian tendencies that he's shown uh, since he's been in power. But the opportunities are there to provide a check through elections uh, on folks. Again, another caveat in terms of opportunities, but still remains one. And then finally, the threats. Uh, and I think the threats are plentiful, but I will really uh, put two out there. Uh, one is this has essentially been a lost year and can potentially be a lost years, right? Uh, the impact of COVID uh, plus the two storms that hit Central America have hindered the ability of the state uh, to provide true education, right? Which now you're likely to see a whole uh, group of students uh, from the K to 12 system uh, essentially drop out, uh, look for other means of work to provide for their families, uh, or just become disengaged altogether, right? The rise of the Ninis, as we saw in 2013, which led to the massive migration towards the United States, right? Um, it's really a lost opportunity and a lost time frame that you're not going to get back. How do we re-incentivize uh, them to get back into school or create the conditions that allows them to get back in school? Uh, again, this is part of those opportunities of rebuilding from scratch, something certainly to consider. And then finally, uh, these ungoverned spaces, or as I like to call them, alternatively governed spaces, right? It is no surprise to many here that illicit groups are taking the role of governing seriously, whereas the state cannot, right? They're using as a way uh, to gain what we call influence trafficking, right? Gain influence within the population, uh, whereby now the population is dependent for economic livelihood and social services to the gangs or to the drug trafficking organizations because they're providing that particularly in the rural areas. Whereas the general government, uh, Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala, Nicaragua, are unable to provide those services to the population. This not only strengthens the illicit actors, but it gives them a stronghold long-term, right? Uh, there was an example a few years back where a famed drug trafficker was actually protected by the population against the police, where you had members of the population fighting off the police with sticks and knives uh, to protect this drug trafficker because they understood that this individual here was responsible for their ability to live a more prosperous uh, life in their perception, right? So it's, it's really interesting the ability uh, uh, of that threat uh, long term by having these alternative governed spaces and the lack of state uh, presence within these regions. So uh, on that uh, pessimistic note, uh, Miguel, I turn it back to you. Thank you, Randy. Thank you, Randy. Uh, I recognize that um, most of the interventions today have been quite pessimistic, right? But Still, the question and the pending question that we have in the next panel also will have is what to do. But before we get into that, let me let me address the questions that are that are coming. We have more or less half an hour to for the discussion. So I also invite our our audience, you who are watching this event, to submit your your questions and to help us with the with the with the discussion so we have so far we have three questions that i think uh each of us can can address the first question is who and what type of people were surveyed i think if referring to the surveys i i i, I use in in my in my presentation in el salvador san salvador depending on your status uh rich or poor 
the poor are not aware of the, rep the repercussions of, of climate change. So this is a question. Let me let me try to answer this. I, I think, well, the, the LAPOP, uh, which I collaborate with, uh, do their they do their surveys all over uh, Central America and in each country they develop a sample a representative sample right uh, randomly selected to basically represent the whole of the Salvadorian or Guatemala or Costa Rican population so in that sense I think we can we can rely in in the data that most Salvadorians, uh, even those uh, in, uh, who live in poor neighborhoods or disadvantaged uh, neighborhoods, see climate change or view climate change as a as a as a threat and as a, a concern, right? Uh, and it's very clear, as I said in my presentation, that Central Americans tend to be more aware of these of the threats of the risks that climate change, among others, represent than in other areas, than in other countries, right? Particularly in, in the United States. In the United States, still, you can see, you can clearly see these sort of uh, divided uh, perceptions and, and polarized uh, vision about climate change. In Central America, I think that's not the case. In Salvador, it's not the case. So, so I would say that even, even in those rural areas uh, uh, that seem not very uh, in tone with the national conversation and other topics, they do recognize the impact of, of, of climate change. Um, we have another another comment uh, that says uh, the disparities and inequalities of an education combined with insecurity of their environment is a perfect combination for political strategic plays. Churches in every corner and what is supposed to be climate change discussion often often as leads expects climate migration to be based on lack of religion. Leadership also deals with livelihood and there seems to be no end to the political place. The people want to be involved and advocate, but the costs are very high. Um, Randy, what do you think about that? Especially the last one, the last part, the people want to be involved and advocate, but the costs are very high. I think it's a legitimate uh, point, right? I think, um, I think there's two parts to it. One, I think, uh, you know, behavior is shaped by perceptions of reality, not reality itself. Uh, I didn't create that. Um, I'm paraphrasing from someone else, but uh, that's to say that, you know, your behavior is shaped by your ability to understand your situation, your circumstances, and then, you know, you respond in ways in which you feel it's going to earn your favor. I think this works both from a civilian perspective and also from uh, a political perspective, right? Um, I wrote a piece called "The Cost of Failed Leadership" that literally that criticized uh, leadership across Central America for their inability to really meet the demands of citizens um, because corruption has has impacted it. Right. So I think uh, for the political perspective, their position is to maintain power or grow in power or set up for the next elections in many cases. Right. So I think changing the perception of it's not you know we're doing good in COVID or those that are migrating have no religion or, you know, shaping the argument uh, using their ability of the media, uh, you know, their influence through the media uh, to shape perceptions. I think that's a universal trait. Uh, and I think something that we've seen, not just in Central America, but throughout the Americas and potentially throughout the world. I think from a civilian perspective, uh, I think this goes to Eric's point of hopelessness, right? Um, you're get, you've become to a point where a lot of citizens uh, automatically will tell you, and it doesn't take you uh, more than a day uh, of walking around Honduras or El Salvador for you to hear someone say, yeah, all politicians are corrupt, right? Uh, regardless of if you have evidence that they're corrupt or anything, uh, the natural assumption has become that they are corrupt. This is not to say that they're not corrupt. Many are. Um, but I think we've kind of created a situation where citizens feel lack of political will equals 
corruption, right? There's lack of will to improve the education system. There's lack of will to improve the healthcare system. There's lack of commitment uh, to improve the infrastructure or challenge anti-corruption efforts, right? Uh, and you see this and you automatically assume, okay, they have to be corrupt because why would a non-corrupt public official who's in it for the public good not do something to improve conditions? Um, but we also have to look at the alternative conditions, right? Lack of resources, lack of time, lack of, you know, a uh, change isn't made overnight, especially in Central America. Um, so uh, there's a balance that has to be played, but it's very difficult if you're uh, living in poverty uh, in, in Comayagua uh, and, and you don't have access to healthcare uh, during the COVID environment and you're seeing your friends and family be hurt. It's very difficult to be patient. Um, and it's, you know, it's very easy to then blame the government. Um, so it's tough. It's a tough question to answer. I agree that the situations, you know, are different. Um, but at the same time, it, it really depends on your position and, and your ability to look at the whole picture as opposed to just your situation. But I agree, it's extremely difficult. Thank you, Randy. Eric, I'm going to direct this, this comment slash question to, to you. And it refers to migration, uh, something that you have been working on uh, recently. It says, uh, migration is a leading issue which needs to be discussed and on the table. Infrastructure, climate change, education, salaries, inequality, or political leaders have caused many to take a risk, referring to migration. The data on crime seems wrong. Doctors are seeing far more from injuries or death, perhaps uh, during COVID-19. The numbers may seem of, but uh, let me see. Numbers may seem out, uh, but the people live in fear from the guns and corruption and hold on to the people and the government. I know it's, uh, it's a little bit confusing at uh, the end, but basically I think it's addressing the issue of migration. You're muted. Sorry about that. Um... I mean, I, th I think what we're trying to say is that it is complex and there are a combination of factors, both your personal experience and your, your view or sense of, of your surrounding and the environment in which you live. You may, you may have a job, maybe not great, but you may have a job, you may be not sick, you may not have COVID, uh, you may not have experienced death in your family, uh, and yet, your feeling of hopelessness, uh, subjective well-being is low, and so you choose to migrate. I think what we're trying to say is that um, this is not a simple um, correlation between homicide rates and migration. Homicide rates can come down and migration go up. Uh, you know, and the economy in Central America and in Honduras has improved. It's not going gangbusters, or, you know, but it has gotten a little bit better. Uh, so, you know, how we look at these factors and the combination they, uh, uh, of those factors and how they affect people overall uh, is a little more uh, uh, complex and difficult to get a handle on. I, my, my this is my personal point of view is that the last uh, four years have been spent too much telling people, don't come, don't come. It's, it's dangerous, it's bad, we're gonna build a wall, we're gonna keep you out, don't come. And you know, I don't know that that really improves or takes any, makes any difference in how people in Honduras, Guatemala, Salvador are really experiencing their lives. And in many cases, it may slow things down for a while. I think COVID has had uh, uh, you know, a dissuasive impact, uh, effect on migration, but I think we're, we're starting to see an uptick uh, as, as, as the situation changes, as people get more desperate, uh, especially after hurricanes and whatnot in Central America. Um, so, you know, those combination of factors are probably uh, also ones we need to think about from a policy point of view uh, it's not just about lowering homicide rates, but it's the general sense. 
and people do experience corruption and the, and the impacts of corruption um, very adversely, whether it's for them personally or for their family or their sense of their country as a whole. Thank you, Eric. Uh, let me just jump in on, on that uh, topic too, on, on migration. Uh, um, some of my colleagues here at, at LAC and, and myself uh, two years ago uh, conducted a, a, a research, a field work in Mexico with migrants, for migrants who were coming or who were stuck in Mexico and were originally coming in the caravan. So, uh, we interviewed more than 100 of them in different places in, in Tapachula, in Mexico, in Mexico City, uh, in Toluca, and some in some refugee centers, and the and, and the whole um, the whole impression of talking with them was that they have gotten to a point in which the only the only option for them to continue. Uh, with their lives, uh, not even you know as a choice, but because of the threats by gangs, because of the threats even by security forces, because of droughts, severe droughts in the case of Guatemalans, especially that we interview, uh, uh, they seem all you know that they were taking that risk because there were no, nothing else, right? And when they put it in sort of the balance, they, they used to say to us, look, if I'm going to die, I prefer dying trying to get to the border than over there, than in Honduras, right? In the hands of somebody or because I'm going to die out of starving, right? So I prefer doing this, right? Even though I know it's hard, it's been very hard. It's, many of them have faced terrible, terrible uh, uh, plights, uh, challenges, and, and, and still they were determined to continue because they didn't have any, any, any other option. Right? Um, Miguel, if I can jump yeah, in on that point. I, I think, you know, I think your point is extremely well taken. I want to, I want to caveat something, right? Because, uh, you know, we've all talked about this, right, in terms of security situation has improved. Um, but let's not be under any impressions that we're saying that all of a sudden, you know, uh, Central America's Northern Triangle is like Switzerland or Sweden, uh, right? We're, we're not saying that at all. What we're saying is relative to where it was in 2013, 2014, uh, or even as recent as 2017 in, in, in El Salvador, the conditions are exponentially improved, um, but it's a relative number. They're still the most violent states in the world. Uh, so, so let's not do that, right? So number one, uh, violence against journalists. Number one, vi femicides, so violence against women. Uh, number one, violence against LGBTQI community. Uh, these are not safe areas, right? Activists, uh, whether you're environmental activists like Berta Caceres or you're a, you know, indigenous rights group leader, uh, you're at risk in these countries and it's unfortunately has become in recent years a way of life. Uh, this is not to say it's okay not to bypass it, uh, but it is to say, you know, you can still recognize all those things and see where, you know, some areas of growth are to look for that little light to be able to add to it. Uh, on the migration front, uh, I think one thing that's really important is the role of coyotes, right? Uh, I think the coyotes are the biggest spreaders of misinformation related to migration, right? Um, and they utilize ambiguous US immigration laws to be able to do it. The fact that the United States is arguing amongst itself about what equates to legal versus illegal migration and what actually occurs when you get to the United States, whether it's catch and release laws or otherwise, um, this amb ambiguity is what coyotes are using to be able to sell Folks, I remember in 2013, a lot of folks were told by coyotes, uh, if you have family in the United States, you'll automatically get to stay. We know that the law is not that way, right? Or if you go to the border and you go over and run to a border agent, all you have to say is your life is at risk and you'll be able to stay when the reality is that wasn't true. So I think Eric's point of creating a message uh, that I think is clear and is not just do not come, we're going to send you back. Uh, you need to be able to, to be more elaborate with it and then really dedicate some resources to pushing that message out to Central America 
and being responsive to what the coyotes are putting out. Because again, they have a business model too. They're trying to make their own living, albeit illicitly. Um, you need to be able to respond to that. Thanks, Randy. We have another question that uh, gets uh, gets us to the to to the point of the of the um, of this discussion on the conference. Is there any evidence over decades that natural disasters uh, lead to an uptick in migration in their immediate aftermath? Is there any evidence of that? I'll speak to what I've seen in Honduras a little bit, right? Uh, what I've noticed is particularly around like floods and droughts, uh, especially in the agricultural areas, um, it hurts industries. Um, so what you'll see is internal migration, which I think is extremely important and an underlooked factor, is when you start seeing increased levels of migration from rural areas to urban areas, that creates strain in the urban areas because you only have a finite amount of jobs and now you have a growing population within these areas. And what happens is uh, you'll start to see those, particularly in the middle class, uh, the relative middle class, right, uh, move then to try to migrate towards the United States. Those coming from rural to urban areas, they don't really have the resources. It costs money to leave from Honduras to the United States. It's not a free thing. Uh, it costs money. So uh, those in rural areas, they go to urban areas. And when that becomes overpopulated, urban folks in urban areas start moving towards the United States. But those are byproducts of how droughts and flooding and things like that, landslides, have impacted migration that I've seen uh, in the Honduras case. Eric? Um, yeah, I, I basically agree with that. I, uh, uh, you know, I, I guess I'm trying to remember the question exactly. Are they saying contributed migration in the long haul or what, what was yes, this? Is there that? evidence, whether there is evidence that natural disaster lead to uptick in migration? Oh, just in general? I mean, short general, term? In, in, yeah. I mean, I mean, the evidence I've seen has come mostly from the uh, IOM, International, uh, what is it? Office on Migration? International Office on Migration, yeah. Uh, organization on Migration. Uh, organization. I knew it was an office. They're organized. They're not an office. Um, that is in El Salvador, which you probably know. And they do a lot of good data analysis around movement of people uh, generally uh, in terms of uh, violence internally displaced, but also specifically around uh, um, a natural disaster. And the time that I sat down them to the, with them and, and, and looked at these numbers in great detail was, was after the, the um, volcano in uh, uh, Guatemala a couple of years ago. And they had very detailed map maps of where people fled, where they were resettling, uh, how they, you know, rate at which they were returning and et cetera, et cetera. I mean, people return to the extent that there's a government commitment and, 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 and a private commitment to rebuild to some extent. Uh, but, but there's no question that the uh, people in Guatemala moved and permanently, well, you know, as far as I know, permanently moved uh, as a result of that volcano. You can look, you can see that quite readily in Honduras. Uh, people uh, moved after Hurricane Mitch uh, very clearly. Uh, you know, entire new communities popped up. They were not necessarily more stable communities than the ones before, but people were, went where they could and where the government offered them some shelter. And those become, you know, semi-permanent, uh, eventually regular uh, little towns or communities on the edge of the city. Uh, so unless I'm misunderstanding the question, I think there's pretty clear data and evidence. I would point to IOM as a source of that information of how people move, you know, as a result, first internally displaced, but sometimes, uh, you know, displaced internationally, depending on where the natural disaster happens. I, I agree. In fact, I was I was remembering the data that I've seen in the case of Honduran, migra Honduran migration and Salvadoran migration. In the case of Honduras, if you look at the of the, of the year trends before in the 90s, actually the migration of Honduras to the United States was relatively low. It basically, it increases 
right after the the impact of Mitch, right in, in 98. That's where that's when the sort of the migration uh, uh, started to increase significantly. In the case of El Salvador, uh, El Salvador has had these sort of uh, cyclical movements, right? So after the war, right after the war, uh, migration decreased a little bit, then it started to pick up uh, and it went up very, uh, in a very accelerated way, just after the earthquakes in 2001, if I remember well, 2001, 2002, right? And also remember, uh, oh, Remember that this is, in the case of El Salvador, this is when the U.S. government also uh, uh, provided or adjudicated uh, a TPS to many Salvadorians because of their earthquakes. Uh, uh, uh. So that also is part of the the the, um, the equation, right? Uh, so yes. So the answer, yeah, we have. I think we have some evidence of of of, of that. Um, we have another question here. What role do you see for war regional intergovernmental institutions in addressing social and political aspects of environmental vulnerabilities? What role do you see for war regional intergovernmental institutions? Well, I'm, uh, I guess I'm thinking, you know, <clears throat> specifically in Central America <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you know, Central America has the the SICA Inter-American System uh, uh, Sistema Integration Centro-American. Inter yeah, Central America Integration System. Excuse me, I was got caught there for a minute. Um, it's certainly a place where a variety of issues like the environment are dealt with, uh, borders, migration. A whole host of topics, um, so that's that's kind of a regional intergovernmental space. Um, you know, this is not based on specific data, but I think in general, people felt like that's been a, a remarkably weak and ineffective mechanism, uh, and has not really helped solve specific problems. Uh, maybe that's harsh, but but I don't I don't view that, I haven't seen that as being a very effective space for dealing with climate change in Central America, for instance. And I know that that's a topic that, that they deal with. So now if you're referring to the OAS or the IDB, you know, those all have different roles to play, um, sometimes effectively, but not, not always. Yeah, five things. Is there anything on top of that, Miguel? I'm sorry? If I can jump on Eric's comment, yeah. I think I completely okay. agree with him. I think the different organizations have different roles to play and depending on which organization you're talking about, they, they can play a role, right? Uh, and thinks in, immediately in terms of resources uh, and then just garnering international support outside of just Central America to be able to support uh, the development. Uh, despite the limitations uh, that, these that many of these organizations have, uh, I'd argue that there's better to have a poor institution because you can build and develop it as opposed to having nothing at all. Uh, and then you're pretty much stuck on your own. So I think trying to improve SICA, try to improve the different components of that, uh, as well as bringing in other actors that can provide, uh, at least shine a light to the international community on the, the strife of Central America uh, related to environmental recovery. I think those could be potential positive steps, but I agree they're, they're not as sufficient as they could be. Thank you, Randy. We're approaching the 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 um, the end of the of the panel, but uh, let me let me ask you let me ask you this, and this should be sort of the I know this is part of the uh, one million you know question regarding Central America, and this is you know, I think I we have had the discussion before, but in terms of thinking, especially with the current conditions in Central America. And what we have learned today, especially in the morning about all the vulnerabilities in Central America and that these vulnerabilities are here to stay. And 
disasters and, and extreme events will keep happening. Uh, earthquakes will keep happening. Uh, hurricanes will keep hitting. Droughts will keep, uh, you know. Uh, I think Tanya said early this morning that if you, it's either you have a drought or you have a flood, right? You, if it rains, it rains to the point that it's a flood. And if it doesn't rain, you have a drought and that's sort of the world. So with that in mind, what should be the first, you know, the key steps that Central American societies, not talking on governments, and I think that will be part of the next, uh, the next panel on to some extent, but what society, what our societies in Central America, civil society, what they should do in, you know, uh, what will be the key uh, thing to do in order to address these vulnerabilities? Are they doing it or, 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 or what needs to be done? You know, I think it's really interesting, and I like how you frame the question, Jose Miguel, uh, because you're asking what the people of Central America want, and that's not always the same as what the governments want. You know, the government of Guatemala basically threw out CICIG, shut it down, and what, on its last day or last week, the public opinion polls said that they had 70% approval. Uh, CICIG had 70% approval and was viewed very favorably by a vast majority of Guatemalans. I, I don't know what your numbers show, Jose Miguel, but it's hard for me to believe that any political party or any institution in Guatemala has 70% 70, 70 approval, and probably not even the military or the church for that matter, maybe I'm wrong. But the people of Guatemala, uh, and I would, I would say the people of Honduras and Salvador know what they want. Uh, they've been working for it and they've been fighting for it. And it, I, I would say they've in many ways been betrayed by their own leadership, uh, who's not interested in dealing with governance issues, corruption, and so on and so forth. Look at, let's take the issue of hurricanes uh, for a moment. Yes, it's inevitable that hurricanes are going to hit Central America. Does their damage have to be as profound as it's been since, you know, over the last 20, 30 years since Hurricane Mitch? No, I think the assessments, I worked a lot on her Mitch, the assessments were that Mitch was bad, but was made much worse by human error. Failure to regulate where people build houses. Failure to regulate uh, development on the coastal areas. Failure to properly uh, protect delicate uh, regions along the coast. You know, failure over and over again uh, that made the hurricane not in, you know, not avoidable. That doesn't stop the hurricane, but it can make it less destructive. And I think that's the issue. Unless we deal with governance issues, with corruption, uh, we're going to, you know, Central American people, unfortunately, are going to continue to suffer uh, the failure of their own governments and their own institutions. I believe that they know what's wrong and they know what's up. Uh, and they're, they're, uh, unfortunately, the democratic process is, is really weak and failing in those regions. Uh, we've looked a lot at how illegal campaign finance uh, really funds the political parties of Central America. I point you to a paper by Daniel Sabet at the Wilson Center that looks specifically at Honduras and how corruption in government is used to fund illegal political activities. And that's true in Guatemala as well. So uh, that would be my sense that the people of Guatemala, and I think the US has to decide, you know, which side are they on? Uh, are they on the side of democratic governance and ending corruption or not? And that's, that's the simple but difficult choice. Thanks, Eric. Randy? Yeah, I agree with Eric. I think it's a question of more so political will. Um, I think there, there's two things that you can feasibly do from a civil society perspective. One is vote, right? Uh, you know, if, if you're able to really build a movement 
uh, that allow you to run even better, but at minimum vote in an area or, or a candidate uh, that you feel would take environmental consideration seriously, right? I think the way you do that, and this is the second part, which is, you know, make the case for environmental, you know, resiliency, right? So uh, one thing we learned from Hurricane Andrew here in, in Miami was uh, that the building codes were not adequate to deal with a storm uh, of the magnitude of Andrew, right? Uh, you should have had those lessons learned from Mitch, and now you should have a new set of additional lessons learned from Iota and Etta, right? right? So right. doing a no kidding uh, post wrap of what went right, what went wrong in terms of resilience, you know, where are your population centers? And if your population centers are vulnerable uh, to, to touchdown, uh, then you need to increase building codes and ensure that the, 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 you're able to respond to that. Second is the disaster recovery and relief effort, right? Uh, I think Central American governments and Latin American governments in general uh, are fortunate because the U.S. is such a key ally in this area. You have other in-state actors like Brazil and Chile uh, that support in disaster relief. Uh, so I think sharing of best practices, providing training uh, and efforts, which these countries are doing, taking advantage of that and, and building it. And then third, making the case that environmental resiliency uh, creates economic opportunity, right? By building, you know, you know, more, you know, having coding standards that are higher, now you create opportunities for more construction jobs. You have opportunities for more engineering jobs, right? You have more opportunities uh, for renewable energies and, and focus towards building those capabilities uh, within these communities, uh, building smart cities that allow you to understand uh, where vulnerable populations are after the, uh, the uh, before and after a hurricane hits. So I think there's a lot of opportunities associated with it, but you have to make that case to those in politics. And if you're unable to make that case effectively, then you have to frankly vote them out and bring in others that are gonna do it. The problem there is uh, there seems to be a lack of political will regardless of party uh, in many of these countries. And, and that's a big issue there. Thanks, Randy. I'm just going to add, uh, I agree with both of you. I will echo also what Eric said uh, at the beginning. I mean, in his last point about, you know, the popularity of CC and whether other institutions in Guatemala or any Central American country for that matter will match, you know, the levels of popularity of CC. I don't think any any governmental institution or any political institution in, in Central America will get to that level. And I'm sorry for those Salvadorians who believe that that's not the case for Bukele, but I think uh, the, 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 the marriage of, of, of Bukele was 70%, I think, really think that is less than that, but enough, obviously, to win the, the, the elections. The problem is, and, and echoing again what you guys have said, is that uh, the electoral systems have developed these incentives in which you know politicians win for uh, win with the uh, with the bare minimum, and they take that as a mandate to ignore you know all the demands and requests of the population to respond to the to the to the chronic problems in in in, in Central America, right? So to the extent that we, uh, civil society, academics, uh, different actors, do not, do not uh, help to develop uh, accountability mechanisms in, in, in the region. We will keep seeing this behavior of ignoring, you know, the population, ignoring the, act, the, the vote and the desires of the population and ignoring the risk uh, uh, posed by by disasters, uh, by <clears throat> the vulnerabilities that Central America face. So with that note, if Eric, Randy want to say anything, want to add anything, uh, we're right almost at the hour. I have nothing to say more than what Jose Miguel has said. I've learned everything I know, I've learned from Jose Miguel. So I don't need to say no, anything more. Quite the contrary, I'll <laughs> learn it from you. Ditto, I agree with uh, what Eric said regarding Miguel. Thank you all for the chance to talk today. Thank you. Thank you, thank you guys for this uh, uh, excellent panel. Uh, we'll continue the conversation. Uh, well, again, thank you to Eric Olson and 
thank you to Randy Pestana for, for this discussion. And we'll continue our discussion on vulnerabilities and, and, and risk in, in Central America with our last panel that we will start in 15 minutes. It's, and we will talk about the role of its original partner, precisely. And we will be joined by former President Luis Guillermo Solis Rivera, former president of Costa Rica, uh, also by Saskia Karuski, who uh, is a member of the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction, and Donna Renag, who is a trustee, trustee I'm sorry, of Florida International University Board of, uh, in, here in Miami. So I ask you to, let's take a break, a 15 minute break. You go to take, you know, a, a sip of water or a coffee, and then we meet again, we rejoin again here in 15, in 15 minutes. So thank you again. <laughs> 